Today, Blackpool Sands on the Kingsbridge to Dartmouth coastal road is a beach full of family fun at the mouth of a stream. But 600 years ago, this was the site of the biggest battle you've probably never heard of. From the early 1300s, France and England had been engaged in a series of armed conflicts caused by disputed claims by the English House of Plantagenet and the French House of Valois to the French throne. This, the Hundred Years' War, is famous now principally for not lasting a hundred years. In fact, it carried on for 116 years, four months, three weeks and four days, with large chunks of Europe eventually being swept up in the war. You may have heard of the Battle of Cressy, the famous victory of the English forces over a much larger French army, in no small part down to the longbow, the formidable English weapon, and the skilled archers who wielded it. Today we're here with Dennis and Mary Eggington, who are local enthusiasts, who are going to tell us a little bit about the history of the longbow and about the skill needed to fire them. Dennis, why was the longbow so effective as a weapon? Uh, the longbows were incredibly accurate and powerful. Um, a well-trained archer had been shooting from eight years old, could fire eight, nine arrows in a minute at very high accuracy and power. The longest recorded distance from back was 345 yards. Uh, the bots in training were usually stationed at about 220 yards away and at that distance you could put an arrow through the, something the size of a bracelet. The large bows had up to 220 pound draw which meant most archers ended up with hugely overdeveloped shoulders from actually drawing constantly. <laughs> at eight years old, all males had to do at least an hour's archery practice every week, which is why so many places around are called the butts, because it's where the archery butts of the villages would have been. At Cressy, the English army numbered between seven and 15,000 soldiers. Nearly 50 years later, perhaps as many as 6,000 English troops, although probably fewer, were gathered here in Devon to fight another French battle, this time on home turf. With constant battles and incursions on both countries' coasts, by 1404 the tide was swinging in the favour of the French. French warlord William de Châtel saw an opportunity and assembled a fleet of 300 ships at St Malo to bring 2,000 knights and men-at-arms, as well as infantrymen and crossbowmen, across the Channel to invade Devon. De Chatel had had some success in an invasion of Plymouth in 1403. His strategy had been to avoid attacking the fortified citadel directly and instead he chose to disembark along the coast and invade overland. The following year, spurred on by his previous result, his target became the powerful trading port of Dartmouth. One day out of port, de Chatel's fleet encountered not the English navy, but a fleet of Spanish wine ships. Despite these being friendly ships counted as France's allies, the allure of the cargo was too great, and part of the war fleet broke away on its own enterprising errand. De Chatel and his commanders, the lords of Chateaubriand and de Gelles, fell out, with Chateaubriand and his part of the war fleet sailing off. De Chatel and de Jail continued to the English coast and anchored off the beach here in Start Bay, where they waited six days for their scattered fleet to reassemble. Here, at St Saviour's Church in Dartmouth, you'll find a brass relief commemorating one of the town's most celebrated sons, John Hawley. The unscheduled halt gave the English plenty of warning of what was to come and privateer John Hawley, a former Lord Mayor and a wealthy Dartmouth merchant, took the opportunity to draw together men and troops from inland to create a defensive army. However, he wasn't starting from scratch. King Henry IV had previously tasked Hawley with building a private seagoing force to defend the coast. Prior to this, Hawley had been the driving force behind the building of Dartmouth Castle, which still stands today. Hawley's fleet and forces had already had some success, capturing 30 French ships and 1,000 tonnes of wine on their first incursion into northern France. The French subsequently claimed this army numbered 6,000 men, although it's likely this was greatly exaggerated. At the time, the entire population of Dartmouth would have been around 700. 
Expecting the French to land at Blackpool, the English dug a ditch along the valley and dammed it at the sea end, built a narrow causeway as the only crossing point, and prepared to defend the eastwards advance from the higher ground at Stoke Fleming. After waiting six days, de Chatel decided to go ahead with his attack. From an original force of over 2,000, he could only muster a measly 200 men-at-arms and a few hundred others to land, probably here at Slapton Sands. Heading east towards Street, the invading French army were disheartened to find a well-organised English peasant army dug in at Blackpool. We're here with Sir Geoffrey Newman, whose family own the Blackpool and Start estate. Sir Geoffrey, thank you for allowing us to be here with you today. Nice to see you here. So why would they have chosen these particular beaches? Well, these beaches are mostly in this area here of shingle and needn't be big stones, it'd be quite fine stones. But a shingle beach um, means that you can nose the boat right up to the shoreline and jump off. Whereas a soft sand beach with, say, the surfing, um, you, you, you wouldn't be able to do that because it'd be too shallow. So the ideal for that, and of course it's the reason why the Slapton Sands were used for the D-Day practice with, with English and American soldiers. Formulating their plans here at Street, to Chatel and to Jail, disagreed about their strategy. De Chatel favoured a flanking approach and possibly an all-out retreat, whilst de Jail was in favour of a direct attack. I mean, what they'd done to repeat a very successful campaign, the French did um, the year before, when they did a similar flanking exercise in Plymouth and they ransacked parts of Plymouth. So they decided to try and do this again because Dartmouth merchant traders, of which my family would have been probably one of those, were harassing the French traders over in France. So they wanted, they could not get into Dartmouth, who was heavily defended, to do this flanking exercise again round the back. But they were thwarted this time. De Jail insisted that the defending English army were no more than a bunch of peasants. And with his honour offended, de Chatel leapt from his horse and began to lead a disorganised attack. They came inland um, uh, with a force of, of foot soldiers and uh, knights in armour. But what they'd failed to do uh, is to bring their covering artillery, the arrows. But they marched down from, from Slapton Sands down Wide Wall Valley, just over there. It looks quite steep coming down there now. Everything is steep in this area here. And so, yes, it would have been. And when they came to the bottom here, they were confronted with this creek, muddy creek. Rather than deploying crossbowmen to defend the advancing troops, the men-at-arms were left unprotected as they were shot at by the highly skilled English archers and pelted with stones by the women folk. The ladies, apparently, were uh, equipped to slingshot with stones. So it was, um, I think they were taken aback, the French were taken aback by this force. And when they, um, Jubail got off his horse because he was hesitating and then rushed forward um, into the creek with his arm and everything on, floundered in the creek. The rest of the knights came along with their horses and everything else, floundered in the water and the mud. And I'm afraid there was absolute slaughter here. Um, and the French were severely defeated. I mean, the landscape here, where we're standing now, would have been a muddy creek working its way up Blackpool Valley. Okay? There's a stream coming down, but the sea would have been penetrating through right up here. Um, so it was quite a formidable barrier in itself. Um, now, this is all filled in now, and the sea is, 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 is further away. So um, the topography here would have been wooded hillsides, um, tracks and cart tracks, um, very primitive and remote, um, which it made it quite an obstacle for any um, force trying to um, um, land here. Some of the French knights attempted to ford the marshy valley, but the deep water and the weight of their armour meant that very few made it across, covered in mud and weed, to the other side. Forced in the steep valley, to attempt to cross a makeshift English causeway, the French troops were unable to gain a foothold and fell back. De Chatel refused to retreat and was killed, having fought a valiant battle. 
almost 200 French troops were captured, a good proportion of the original attacking force, including three lords, 22 knights, and two of de Châtel's own brothers. These hostages would have gained their captors a good deal of ransom money, likely being sold to the king for further negotiations and trade. By all accounts, this English victory by a private peasant army was well celebrated at the time, with one chronicler saying, the crows have pecked the eyes of the eagles. King Henry himself was elated at this English triumph in the secluded valley at Blackpool Sands, and a service of thanksgiving was held at Westminster Abbey. Following the failed attack on Dartmouth, there are suggestions that de Chattel's brother Tanagai led another raid on the town later that year, burning much of Dartmouth to the ground. However, we can find no local record of this event. Thank you very much. So the next time you're enjoying an ice cream in this sheltered little cove, think back 600 years to those local Dartmouth and Blackpool people who were so determined to defend this coastline. If you would like to visit the site of this English victory, then head over to Blackpool Sands on the South Devon coast, which is a private run family beach and has a delightful cafe on site where you too can enjoy an ice cream from its takeaway as well. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel to help us make more films. You can also support us on Patreon for exclusive early access and other perks.